Hello. Nyado. <laughs> Nyado ne. Hi everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Ah, uh, Death Toysers. Confetti, hi. Glad you can make it. Hi, Velocitrus. Welcome, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to spoopy, spoopy bedtime stories. Did you have a good day? Did you have a good Saturday? <laughs> Spoopy book time! It is! It is spoopy book time. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I don't know how many stories we'll be able to get through. Because <laughs> I plan to read them very, uh... Dramatically. <laughs> House chores today. Me too. Me too, confetti. I was doing some cleaning today. Ah, trying to get my house clean. It is cold. It is chilly today where I am. And it was quite nice to open up the house and feel cool. <laughs> ah, you did some grocery shopping and cleaning. Nice, nice. I never got to my floors though. My floors are still a mess. <laughs> but I cleaned everything above the floor. <laughs> And I'm halfway through laundry. <laughs> but overall, it was a pretty good day. Pretty good day. I hope you guys had a good day too. I hope you are ready. I hope you have your comfy pants on. I hope you have your blankie. I hope you have your hot cocoa. <laughs> I hope you are prepared for poetry. <laughs> Have you guys read these stories and poems in school before? Is that something that you've done? Ooh, perfect. Yeah, get some tea. Some herbal tea. Is the music too loud? Do you guys think? Is it too loud? I'm gonna have some other music playing. Some... Light. A little tab. Let me try that. School for you was like 11 plus years ago? Yeah, same. It's been a long time. It's been a long time since I read some of these. I may have listened to. <laughs> I may have listened to a quick read along. <laughs> Just to remember the the candor, like the can the canter, the the way you talk, the way you say this poem. I hope I, I hope I, I hope I read it right. It's a long poem, long time. I'm gonna lower the music a tiny bit more, but there's more. Um, there's different music that I'm gonna have that I hope doesn't overwhelm my words. It's in the- I linked it in the credits. There's a free, um, there's a lovely, a lovely, lovely collection of free, uh, suspenseful, spooky, instrumental music by Ghost Stories Incorporated. And so I have that queued up on Spotify. You see that down there. And I thought that would provide some lovely background to our story time tonight. And I also have some fire crackling <laughs> to get us... We're all sitting around the campfire here. Did you bring your marshmallows? Don't hog all the marshmallows. And don't burn them. <laughs> Actually, I think some people like to burn their marshmallows, right? They like to set their marshmallows on fire. I I think marshmallows should be toasted to a, 
a toasty golden brown. So I spend a lot of time trying to get my marshmallow perfect. <laughs> are you are you the type of person to set your marshmallow on fire? I try to avoid it if I can. Yeah, you gotta have a real te good technique for roasting if you want it to be golden brown. You have to have a really good technique. You gotta you gotta hold hold the stick with two hands and do like a rotisserie chicken. You gotta you gotta slowly roast the marshmallow like a rotisserie chicken, uh, and be very patient and pay close attention. It cannot be blackened. Yes, it must not. It must not get blackened by the fire. Impeccable timing. I'm only half an hour late. Mary, Lobo! Congratulations on Affiliate Lobo! Hello, welcome! I hope you're having a fantastic evening. We just wrapped up a recording session. Dang, you got the rest of the night. <laughs> Now it just needs to render. <laughs> nice. People that flame the mallow get a crusty outside and not a melty center. Yeah. I like I like it all evenly toasted. We're talking about marshmallows. We're talking about how you like your marshmallows, because we're sitting by the fire here before we get to reading. Um, and I'm hoping you brought some to share. That's so awesome though, Lobo. I'm so I'm so excited for you. That's <laughs> Congrats. Oh, here, I can do this. Ho ho ho. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Go follow Lobo, he just got affiliate! <laughs> so hyped to get my guts spooked clean off. Poe certainly has a way with his words. Certainly has a way with his words. I'm kind of sad that I don't have a super deep voice because I was listening to like a read along for the Raven and I, there was someone on YouTube who had like corpse husband level deep voice and I was like oh my god I should just play that on stream <laughs> and just pretend like it's me <laughs> I'll just lip sync it would that be fun <laughs> this music is actually not what's down there this music that's playing is actually the Glimwood Tangle music from Sword and Shield. Played at 75% speed. <laughs> Glimwood Tangle is such a beautiful place in Sword and Shield. I wish I could, like, live there. Don't you? With all the glowing mushrooms and all the, all the fairies. Maybe not with all the infidimps. <laughs> but I'll take more Galarian Ponytail, please. I'll take a dozen. I'll take a dozen of your finest cotton candy horses. Please and thank you. I'll take that for Christmas. <laughs> if only Pokemon Unite would put in Galarian Ponytail, my life would be complete. My entire being. <laughs> All right, did you bring everything else that you need for your s'mores tonight? Did you get your graham crackers and your Hershey's chocolate? This is not a, a, a sponsored stream. <laughs> but what other chocolate would you use? There's no other chocolate that you could. <laughs> you want to live in the, tang the Glimwood Tangle with them imps? <laughs> What's the other one? The Morallels. Yeah, yeah, the Morallels. Dot the landscape. So, we're, as we read the raven, we're going to be transporting ourselves somewhere a little drearier 
than the Glimwood Tangle. They have Nestle chocolate. Yeah, but then it's Nestle. <laughs> I guess that, uh, I'm sure Hershey's is not too much better. Curiously enough, I feel like cotton candy by itself tastes kind of like whatever, but cotton candy flavored stuff freaking slaps. I love cotton candy everything. Actually, I may have a couple of sticks of rock candy downstairs that I've been eyeing, waiting to eat. <laughs> Cotton candy, rock candy, it's all so good. I can't pass it up. It takes me forever to eat it, but when I do, I'm so happy. Mmm. I'll pass you. Do you want a grape or a blueberry rock candy? Cotton candy brings out your inner party pony. Your 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 inner hold on. Don't wait. Your inner pinkie pie. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Here's your here's your blueberry rock candy. All right, everyone got their candy and their s'mores and their blankets and their hot chocolate and you've got your your spooky listening ears on. Make sure you put your spooky listening ears on. Onto the pole, exactly. We're going to begin. I'm going to end our Glenwood Tangle listen and begin our spooky ambiance. Now the Spotify will be correct. I'm gonna have it on random. <laughs> I wonder if the songs will do a good job at matching the, po the, the stories and the poems. <laughs> All right. This is a sound check. This is an official pre-spooky story sound check. How is the campfire sound? How is... Maybe I'll lower that a tiny bit. How is the campfire sound? How is the, the, the light? Suspenseful music sound. I might put that up a little bit. Alright. How do we feel? Do we feel good about this sound check? Check, check. One, two, three. Check, check. <laughs> Is this pleasant to your ears? Are we are we in a good place? Campfire, good. Music, good. Mic, up. Whoa, I'm in the I'm in the yellow. I'm in the orange. I'll live in, I'll live in the orange. I'll live in the orange section of the bar. Is this better? I I turned it up a tiny bit. Is this better? I'll try not to shout. Lovely. Thank you all. All right. Tonight, tonight, we will begin by reading The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, published in 1845 in the public domain and thus safe to stream and read aloud to y'all. If you like a song that is playing during our readings, you can look down there and note that down. Um, we will have the title of whatever we're reading up here. And on the left, we have our read along uh, words. And we can also click and if we don't know a word, we can find out words, which is so great. I love this website. <laughs> so here we go. It is time to begin. The Raven. Poopy reading, Jeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
All right. I shall begin. Oh, hey, all guys, I must. Jinji san. Have a good day. <laughs> <clears throat> the Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain, rustling of each purple curtain, thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." But <laughs> presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there and nothing more deep into that darkness peering long i stood there wondering fearing doubting dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before but the silence was unbroken and the stillness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word lenore this i whispered and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore! <laughs> Nearly this and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all oh, my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely, that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stood a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obscene made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched upon my chamber door. Perched upon a bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. No, he's bowing. <laughs> he's not bowing. <laughs> then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. <laughs> Much I marveled this, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I just, I came up with the birds <laughs> just now, okay. <clears throat> Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly. 
Though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as... Nevermore. <laughs> But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. <laughs> Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only sock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Let me put that above here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is a, uh, <laughs> it is a, it is a creature, this raven. <laughs> <clears throat> But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the, vel the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy thinking what this ominous bird of yore what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there, balm in Gilead, tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> but some thick ass bird of you I love it, thank you. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Um Company, if you're on mobile, I think it's like on the top right of your chat. I had to learn because I, I liked to play the sound alerts in Ginge's chat. <laughs> I also couldn't find the sound alerts button for a while. <laughs> you're good, you're good. <laughs> Did I do this one? No. <clears throat> Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant, distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels named Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels named Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. 
Be that word our sign and parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy bleak out from out my heart and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven. Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just oh my above gosh, my chamber me. door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. Shh. I didn't know there was singing in this. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Bruh. <laughs> well timed, bruh. <laughs> what a beautifully well timed, bruh. <laughs> Thank you. Nevermore. Oh, okay, it's water time. What do you guys think? <laughs> Was that good? <laughs> mm. Was that okay? <laughs> Was that fun? I will tell you that in school when you would when we would read these types of things, I would never volunteer to read them aloud. So you guys are very special. Okay, you guys are very, very special. Very special occasion. I love this poem. I love reading poems. I want to do. I think I. I think I mentioned this to Flair one time, but I really would love to put together a VTuber poetry slam. I think that would be super super fun. <laughs> I really want to make it happen one day. I really want to invite people to write poems and per and perform poems on stream i think that would be the the coolest it would be super radical <laughs> ah so fun so fun i love the i love the way this one reads thank you thank you thank you ah what would you think about the raven what would you do if you had a a big bird on your door. <laughs> I know the... I don't know if they're ravens or crows, but there are some birds outside of my house here that make very strange noises. <laughs> I think I mentioned when I was playing Eternal Darkness that, um, that, um, the bone... I don't know if they're the bone thieves. Whatever the ones with the little scythe arms when they make that noise after you hit them, that's definitely what the birds do outside my house. I can't even, I can't even reproduce it for you. Hi, burb friend. Just, just greet the burb. Welcome, burb, into thine abode. <laughs> Invite the bird ashore. <laughs> I think it would be really cool to have a raven friend. You ever see those posts on Reddit where they like make friends with the ravens with some with some peanuts and stuff? I would totally love that. I would totally love to bribe a bird into bringing me shiny things. <laughs> I think that would be the coolest thing ever. I would also befriend the bird. I would welcome the burb with open arms. So let's see, that was the raven, that was the only poem on this list, the rest are short stories. Um, we can do, I think the next one I had was the telltale heart. Come on, get up there, there you go. The telltale heart, have you guys heard this story before? Do you guys like stories about people going insane do you guys do you guys like stories about people losing losing it <laughs> the story rules 
I'm I'm very interested to see how I do reading reading you guys a story without like the flow of a poem. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> mm. Stretching, sorry. Mm, the telltale heart. This one is really creepy. Oh, it's cut off. Let me help. Let me fix that. It's cut off a little bit for you guys. That's no good. There we go. Perfection. There we go. It's not too long. It's just about as long as the raven was, maybe. <clears throat> so next, I will be reading The Telltale Heart, also by Edgar Allan Poe, published in 1843. Shall we begin? Hopefully you don't have any skeletons in your closet. <laughs> or else you might uh, get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Here we go. Hold on. Oh my god. How dare you sing words. Well, let me let me find one of these that isn't singing. This one's fine. We'll do this one. And we won't. We'll do that. Okay. Wait, what's the evil pianist? Yeah, I like this one. Okay, we're gonna do this one. I was like, I didn't know any of these tracks had... Oh, there's the X-Files. Da -da 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 -da. Just messing with the music. <laughs> Maybe it's aliens. Aliens. There we go. I have the music settled. I didn't know there was tracks with vocals. I don't want any of that nonsense here. Get that out of here. All right, here we go. <clears throat> the Telltale Heart. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The, d d the, <laughs> the disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was his. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation. I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him, and every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it so slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much 
that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. Having keen senses. Of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that I, there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as pitch black with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on, steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, who's there? Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches on the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. <laughs> Pausing to say, living in a place with a lot of crickets now, <laughs> there's no such thing as a single chirp from a cricket. People were really doing this shit before the GameCube channel. <laughs> Truly freak behavior. <laughs> Instead of arguing with your siblings who gets the GameCube, just stare at people sleeping. <laughs> Where were we? The cricket chirp? Yeah. Many chirps of- I had a cricket stuck in my sliding glass door the other week and let's just say a cricket chirping incessantly in your house is not fun. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these supp suppositions, but he had found them all in vain. All in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, distinctness, 
all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And I have not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too, it was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say. Louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so am I. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation, and he was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all ha ha should, should it be ha 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 you feed crickets to be oh beardies bearded dragons are so cute monka w hi i so welcome <laughs> we're killing an old man for his eye <laughs> <clears throat> When I had made an end of these labors, it was, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. A suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been de 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 deputed, de deputed, de de deputed, to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them to search. Search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure undisturbed. 
In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I, myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things, but ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. Sorry, I had to change the song. <laughs> it was bothering me. <clears throat> Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose all over and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think, but anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the blanks, here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Ta -da! <laughs> <Wah! laughs> oh, crazy, crazy people. Crazy, 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 crazy madness, madness. That's such a good story. It's such a good, suspenseful. You can just feel, you can just, you can just feel the dread as you get towards the end. He's so creepy, too, with how carefully he opens doors and sticks his head in. It's... Ooh. What if that happens when you're sleeping at night? Actually, wow. <laughs> I remember being a creepy child. Wow. <laughs> 
I remember being a creepy child and I would totally <laughs> I would totally wait for the lights to go out and everyone to go to bed and I would just creep around the house trying to be as quiet as possible I don't know it was a really strange child I liked to just be in <laughs> just like sit in the dark <laughs> hate when that happens to me. <laughs> I don't know. Same, 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 same ideas. I, I used to try and wake up before everyone and just sit in like the silence. God, I was so weird. Gosh, I was so weird. <laughs> That was a good story. I don't... I assume... I think... I think he's talking about like a glass eye. Right? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the posture. Check. Check. I keep hunching. <sighs> um... I feel like he was just upset at the poor old man's glass eye. Like, he can't help it. That guy's crazy. <laughs> don't room, don't, don't live in the same house as a crazy person is, I think, the, the lesson I want you to take from this. <laughs> and, and don't kill people for their eyes. The old man was half blind, so his bad eye was all discolored. It could be that. It could be that. He could have had a blind eye. I always took it as a as a as a glass one. But it could totally he could have just been blind in one eye. That's true, that's true. He just becomes obsessed. It reminds me not it, it reminds me, it's like when he wrote this story and then he did the black cat, it's like very similar. It's all about paranoia, right? Like they've done something horrible and they feel extremely paranoid and from their guilt and their madness. Oh, it makes it so creepy. Another story I really, 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 really recommend to everyone that we... We'll see how long... We'll see how long my voice can hold out because if, if we can, I'll read you a story called The Yellow Wallpaper. Thank you for the hydrate confetti. Hydration is happening now. Nah. I feel like the yellow wallpaper is a little a little more obscure and it's really 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 good like really good let me see what these sound like like this I want to get this out go away <laughs> what if I just made a playlist like this Add this one to the playlist. I don't like that one. That one's really good. Sorry, I'm just playing with my playlist a little bit here. There we go. I think that's all we need. There we go. All right, we should be good on the, the songs now. There should be no messing with songs. All should be well. <laughs> all right. Ooh, woo. <laughs> Gotta wet the whistle, that's <laughs> true. 
All right, let's see what's what, what's next on the agenda, shall we? Ah. I think this one takes place in Italy, right? Italy or Spain? Which one? Oh, he's, he's a little too big. Hold on. I can fix this. I know how to fix this. There we go. Ha ha! Hee hee! Hoo hoo! <laughs> the cask of Amontillado. Have you guys heard this one? Oh, there's dialogue. Oh, God. I'll do my best. There's a lot of dialogue. That makes it look really long. But as you can see, I think it's it's because of all the dialogue. Have you guys heard of this one before? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Ooh, let's go. <clears throat> Did I say it right? Amontillado? I should look up... Oh... I think it's Italy. Few Italians. Okay. Let's do it. Montresor! <laughs> I'll do my best at pronouncing everything. If I pronounce it wrong, this is my apology up front. <laughs> the Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe published in 1846. Are you ready? Bring yourself to Italy. Think of all the pasta. Think of the catacombs. And the wine. <laughs> Imagine yourself on an Italian street in the evening as we delve into the cask of Amontillado. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point def definitely settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. Already, I'm feeling... Sasuke vibes. <laughs> Let's revenge everyone! <laughs> it must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmery, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress. 
and his head was surmounted by the con conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. That's what I tell you guys, chat. Chat, that's what I tell you. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, Amontillado, a pipe? Impossible. And in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado, I have my doubts, Amontillado, and I must satisfy them. Amontillado, as you are engaged, I'm on my way to Lutresi, and if anyone has a critical turn, it is, it is he. He will tell me. Lutresi, like, right? Lutresi. Lutresi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lutresi, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Ooh, nitrate, potassium nitrate. That don't sound good. Okay, go away now. <laughs> Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been opposed upon. And as for Lutresi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, and putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a rope... Rocalair? Closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to the palazzo. A cloak. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. He had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their scones, sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, I bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. A torch. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together upon the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. Montresors. <laughs> the gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, he said. It is farther on, I said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. What is that? Oh my god. Nitre, he said at length. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? Ugh. 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 <laughs> Am I supposed to be coughing? <laughs> Raid message, raid message, raid message, sad message, sad message, Eve. <laughs> Hello, Basil. Welcome. Oh no, my alerts are behind the now reading. <laughs> Where is the alert box? 
Where is everything? I put everything behind where it's supposed to be. Hello, Raiders. Hello, Basil. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you for the raid. Hello, everyone. Depressed message, Sora. How are you? Is everything okay? Basil's having a bad time. Oh no, Basil. What is the note of sound from? All of my notification sounds I stole from the 2019 fruits basket. <laughs> Thank you for gifting a sub to Basil Confetti. Thank you. Oh, you was having a great, depressing, horrible time. Pantheon 5, was that what you were doing? It's ba oh, Pantheon 4? I did it. I finally beat Hollow Knight. The end of the game, it happened. The boss was defeated by my hand. We all saw the end of the Hollow Knight. Oh, lovely. That sounds great. <laughs> he beat Absrad in the hall. Hi, Heavy. Welcome, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. Definitely, totally, 100% beat the entire Pantheon 5. Oh, I'm so sorry I missed it. I hope everything went well. Doesn't it kind of doesn't and also does sound like it did? Oh my goodness, welcome everyone. He learned he has to do it after 49 bosses first. Oh no. It was mm, great. It feels so accomplished. You should I, I'm just imagining the Tony the Tiger. Great! <laughs> I did beat the entire game in a good go. Go hydrate, yes. Please go hydrate and rest, Basil. Please, please, please go snuggle in a blanket. Thank you for the follow, Ember. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Heavy, thank you also for the follow. I'm sorry I missed it in all the hubbub. The hubbubaloo. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's only 42 bosses. Quick, get Poe to write about Basil Street. Can we get a Poe poem in chat? Um, as a... <laughs> a summary? <laughs> Basil after Hollow Knight. Never more. <laughs> Never more. <laughs> it will go good on my wall next to my trophy for defeating the entire video game of Hollow Knight. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, big oof. Big oof, but big welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So far, I have read out the Riven, the Telltale Heart, and now we are reading the Cask of Amontillado. I'm Medu, if you are new, and tonight I am reading you spooky bedtime stories from Edgar Allan Poe with a possible honorable mention at the end. We'll see how I feel. <laughs> We're halfway through the cask of Amontillado. We're about to get revenge. We're going to avenge our ego. Because what did it say at the beginning of the, what did it say in the beginning of the story? What did the guy do? Fortunato, he, he ventured upon insult. And so now we are vowing revenge and we have just asked him to come look and come with us into the catacombs under Italy under Italy I don't think the cat wait what city are we in Venice or something <laughs> what city has catacombs again <laughs> and we're under the entire country of Italy right now <laughs> I thought I'd already followed you. Yeah, no worries. I like to I like to secretly follow people. <laughs> yeah, some good good Poe stories. Oh, I gotta hydrate. Thank you, Hebby, for the hydrate. 
How far away from me from the cat in the hat? Oh, that would be fun. I would love to do just a random poetry stream. We have to make sure they're all uh, in the public domain though. How long, how old is cat in the hat? I'm drinking my water now. Yeah, thank you for the hydrate again. I'm trying to keep, keep moist, I suppose, so I can speak. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we're too far away from the cat in the hat. That's probably the next poem. That's the next story we're going to read. It's totally the cat in the hat. Water is good for you. It is. I wish I liked water more than I do, but I reluctantly drink it for my health. <laughs> Paris has the catacombs. Paris is France, I think. Wait, Venice? I don't know where we- I don't know geography, y'all. I came from the US education system. I don't know where anything is. So maybe in this story somewhere, they will say the name of a city and then we'll be like, ah, there we are. <laughs> Paris? Venice is Italy? He said Italy though. They're Ital are they Italians living in Paris? I don't know. I'm okay. Before we venture the the Par Paris ca catacombs in Cask of Amontillado. Italy. Italy, 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 Italy. It says Italy. E notes. We're gonna have to go to like, uh, what's, what was the name of that uh, website that you would use in school? <laughs> Cliff Notes? We gotta go to Cliff Notes. Where does it take place? It says it takes place in Italy, so I, I have to assume we're there. Rome. 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 Roman catacombs. The 1800s Roman catacombs, y'all. <laughs> there you go. No, I'm looking at chat. Yeah, Venice is Italy, Paris, Germany, whatever. Yes, it's it's the Roman catacombs. All right, I'm so glad we have centered, anchored ourselves in a place in time, in history, in the world. We are in the Roman catacombs with our friends Fortunato. <laughs> and um, we shall commence, recommence the story. Here we go. My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, said I with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough, he said. The coughs a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. <clears throat> Age like poor man. I True, true, I replied, and indeed I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draught of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knock off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. Drink, I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. 
A huge human foot door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nimo me a moon lacet. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We had passed through the long walls of piled skeletons with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said, it, see, it increases, it hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back here before it's too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first another draught of the medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of the grave. Is this all like alcohol, y'all? Because I don't know. I don't know. This is cursed. Thank you for the this is cursed confetti. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible, a mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing from beneath the folds of my roclair a trowel. You chest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descended again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. <laughs> Fashioned into the... <laughs> you see that? Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall, thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior crypt or recess in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lutresi, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had him fettered. I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of those depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said. Over the wall, you cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. 
but I must first render you all the attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, yet not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not a cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused and holding the flambeau over the mason work threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me back violently. For a brief moment I hesitated, I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position, but now there came out from within the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will not they be waiting us, awaiting us at the Palazzo, the Lady Fortunato, and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes. I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato. No answer. I called again, Fortunato. Still no answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return, only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace, Chris, Chris, rest in peace.
Rest in pepperonis, Fortunato. <laughs> and there you have it. Our journey with Montresor and Fortunato has come to an end. Insult me and I'll wall you up in a grave catacombs. <laughs> well, what do you guys think? I thought that was a very good story. It's been a really long time since I've heard this one. Imagine chaining someone up in the catacombs and then building a wall so no one will find them. And then self you saw how at the end he selfishly was like he was he was reveling. He wanted he wanted the guy to kind of like beg him more. He was like waiting for his reply, right? Oh ah, evil. <laughs> I don't as I, I feel like it's a little excessive <laughs> but then again a lot of uh, the protagonist well are they protagonists I guess in Poe's stories they're antagonists right a lot of the antagonists in these stories maybe aren't thinking straight <laughs> Oh, Amontillado. He just wanted some good wine, man. He just wanted to check out some good wine. He just wanted to. He just wanted to be all wine. So so somile, so some somile. Is not is not the the name of someone who is like a wine connoisseur. Isn't that the name of the job? How fun would that be? You just taste wine and talk to people about wine. It wouldn't be great for me because I only like sweet wines. <laughs> if it's too dry, I don't like it. <laughs> I only like the dessert wines. <laughs> Thank you for the hydrate, Ginge. Nah. Thank you. Sweet wine, yourselves. Like a, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a Riesling. I like that. Those are good. That's why I also like apple cider. Well, it doesn't have to be apple. That's why I like cider. I like sweet things. <laughs> My tail, yeah, it's always been there. Was a pain in the butt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for noticing. Ah, I'm gonna take another sip outside of my outside of the redeem because <laughs> we have the bet I saved the best story for last I saved the most gruesome story for last have you do you remember the black cat this one gave me nightmares. This, oh, no. This one, this one gave me nightmares. This one's up there with like Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery is Stephen King, right? The black cat. Oh, this one is crazy. I wanted to leave your storytelling to lull me to sleep, but I guess plans were thwarted. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, if you are here for this story, now I give you nightmares. It is nightmare time. <laughs> <My guess. laughs> If I recall, this one's really freaky. I might, let's see if I, um, let's see if I have misremembered. If I recall, this one, 
freaks me out. Maybe it's because it's about a cat. It's, it's close to home. Let's start back at deafening silence. <clears throat> Our final entry from Poe tonight is the Black Cat, published in 1845. Are you ready? Are you ready for the outpouring of paranoia, of menace, of madness? Here we go. For the most wild, yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad I'm, yet mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream, but tomorrow I die, and today I would unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events in their consequences. These events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace some intellect more calm more logical and far less excitable than my own which will perceive in the circumstances i detail with awe nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects from my infancy, I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and saga sagacious shrewd dog I need hardly to be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him, who has had frequently frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of this, of his intelligence, 
My wife, who at the heart was not little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, and I mentioned the matter at all for no better reason than it that it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto, if this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend in temperance, had I had I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew, day by day, more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length, even Pluto, who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him, when in his fright at my violence he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence gin-nurtured thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat- oh my god, this is gonna, how bad is this gonna be? I can't handle this. <sighs> I took- from my waistcoat pocket, a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder when I pen the damnable atrocity. Me too, oh my god, stop. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slipped off the fumes of the night's debacle, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty, but it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but as might be expected, it fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philosophy takes no account, yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than that I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart. One of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. 
Who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cold blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bittersweet remorse at my heart, hung it because I know that it had lo I, This is so hard to read, you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> ah, okay, just a story. It's just a story. I knew that in doing so I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity, but I am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house, and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here, in great measure, resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall, a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. The word strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw as if graven in boss relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder, my terror were extreme, but at length reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by some of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of the other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just derailed, just detailed, I <laughs> did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months, I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented for another pet of the same species and of what similar, somewhat similar appearance with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat 
half stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses. And when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated. But... I knew not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former dead deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not for some weeks strike or otherwise violently ill use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added no doubt to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that like Pluto, it had also been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a her necessity, which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loath loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down. <laughs> Cat owners be like. <laughs> or fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress, clamor in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing, so doing partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet, I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I'm almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon's cell, I am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair, of which I have spoken and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remark that this, the reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees. 
degrees nearly imperceptible and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline it was now the representation of an object that i shudder to name and for this above all i loathe and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had i dared it was now i say the image of a hideous of a ghastly thing of the gallows O oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and crime of agony and of death and now was i indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity and a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me, a man fashioned in the image of the high god, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter, I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight an incarnate nightmare that i had no power to shake off incumbent eternally upon my heart beneath the pressure of torments such as these the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed evil thoughts became my soul intimates the darkest and most evil of thoughts, the moodiness of my usual temper increased to hate of hatred of all things and of all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto to stayed my hand. I aimed a blow at the animal, which of course would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished, but this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife, goaded by the interference into a rage more demonical than I redrew, withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated about casting it in the well in the yard, about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements, and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks in the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster, which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And on that note, I'm gonna take a quick water <laughs> sip.
Yeah. <laughs> so ghastly. <clears throat> Shall we continue? And in this calculation, I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while with little trouble I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here at least, then, my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast, which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate. But it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. The monster in terror had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of police came very unexpectedly into the house and proceeded to make rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my blossom, my bosom. I almost said blossom, the Pokemon. Blossom! And roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say, if but one word, by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Whoosome! <laughs> Gentlemen, I said at last, as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say, an excellently well constructed house. These walls, are you going gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane that I held in my hand upon the very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom, of my bosom. 
But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch fiend. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, and howl. A wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in the damnation of my own thoughts. It is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless. Through extremity of terror and awe, in the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth, and solitary eye of fire sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, spooky. Oh. <laughs> well, well, well. Well, well, well. Don't harm animals, please. Thank you. <laughs> no, don't throw your cat out the window. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, thank you for the hydrate. I'm about to take a sip. Actually, I should say that October... No, let me take a sip first. Hold on. Yeah. Thank you for the hydrate, redeem. I will say that October is a very scary month for black cats. And I very much advocate for their safety. And I feel really bad that black cats get such a bad rap. I mean, we did just read a whole story about a totally fine black couple of black cats that totally were just being cats and this guy is absolutely out of his mind um but sometimes like i'll get nervous around halloween with my cat because they say that you should if you have a black cat you should keep them away from the windows because people will do terrible things so just be aware please protect your fur babies and some shelters won't even let you adopt black cats during the month of October because of terrible terrible people um so I in no way shape or form <laughs> endorse anything in this story obviously <laughs> but um that's uh that's for you to know just so you know get a black doggo instead <laughs> Then it's like, um, Sirius, right? Like Sirius Black from Harry Potter. <laughs> what do they call that? The Grim? <laughs> uh, right? They're like, the, that's the symbol, that's the Grim, a black dog following you. Has it been too long since I read Harry Potter? <laughs> I love black cats. I think they're really pretty. 
black cats are super cute. If you have a black cat right now, turn around and give him a hug for me. Um, but yeah, that was the black cat. I guess I was mistaken. I guess he wasn't so paranoid. I guess after he, like, he wasn't as paranoid as the guy in the telltale heart. He committed a bunch of murder and then he was like, ah, cool. I feel great now. So he's obviously quite, uh, uh, quite ill. Maybe. Aw, thank you, Ginge. Thank you for hugging your black cat. Thank you. Give him a big hug. Give him a big hug and a smooch on the top of their head. <laughs> Thank you. That's all my spooky... That's all my Edgar Allan Poe's spooky stories. And unfortunately, I don't think I can read the yellow wallpaper for you guys. Just because I can feel the scratch at the back of my throat. But what did you think of the spookiness? How did you... How did you feel? Did I... Did I give you a good, a good spook for the night? I hope you don't have too many nightmares. 4K, what's that emote confetti? 4K Ultra HD was great. <laughs> I love it. Edgar Allan Poe in 4K. <sighs> Why I'm excited to, um play that game you remember that game that we played the demo of we played uh, slender threads i really liked that game i wonder when that's gonna come out oh you're narrating oh thank you thank you thank you i think i said earlier i don't i've never really like volunteered to like read aloud to people so i'm glad that you liked it thank you um I've never even done anything like theater-y or anything. <laughs> I did read, I did once, okay, there was one time I read someone something. One time I read aloud. <laughs> one time. <laughs> one time I read aloud the My Immortal fan fiction to somebody. <laughs> One time I did a dramatic reading of my immortal for somebody. <laughs> that was quite hilarious. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a fan fiction out there called My Immortal. It's a Harry Potter fan fiction and it's extremely painful to read. It's sometimes been called like the worst fan fiction ever written in history, basically. Um, I think I remember the protagonist's name. I think they're... Isn't it... Ebony Darkness Dementia Raven Way? Isn't that her name? <laughs> Something like that. It's amazing. If you have some time to kill and you want to just read something extremely cringy and hilarious and silly to somebody you should totally read that fan fiction to aloud to someone it's very funny if i like point and click adventure games you should play the titanic point and click oh there's a ta ta a titanic titanic point and click i'd love that i was just watching someone i think it was super eyepatch wolf he did his halloween video today um and he recommended a point and click called Scarlet Hollow. I'd never heard of it before. But I, so I'll have to look up the Titanic point and click. I applaud you for reading the worst fan fiction history. Yeah, after I did need a new pair of eyes. It was very informative. It was very informative. It was, it was a trip. I don't think I read the whole thing to the person. I think we got to something about, I think there was like a concert in the forest in the, what's the forest called? I think there was a, co there was a, there was a, a concert 
It might have been like My Chemical Romance concert in the Forbidden Forest. Yeah. I think that's like where we stopped. <laughs> My friend was like, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Next we're gonna read Sonic fanfic on stream. I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Maybe... Let's see. Oh, there's something else I wanted to tell you guys as well. Let me see if I can find the name of it. Hold on. There was a, um, there was a game on Switch that looks incredibly cursed. And it was on sale. Batum Batula. I don't even know. Batum Batula. I don't even know if anybody knows what that is. I'm gonna look it up real quick. If I can ever get my monitor to come back on. Maybe I've lost it forever. There we go. Let me look it up again. It looked incredibly. Incredibly. Incredibly cursed. Oh, it's on Steam too. Oh, I bought it on Switch. It's an atmospheric exploration game with light puzzle elements. A magical birch is the only thing dictating the future and it is your job to find something appropriate to feed it with. It looks so cursed that I want to play it on stream next week. Let me find the trailer. I watched the trailer on like on my on like the switch. It's not a play store. What would you call it? Hang on. I'll show it for you all. You know how I like to show you guys trailers of games that I plan on playing for some reason. Oop. I guess I have to get the get the window prepared. <laughs> oh no, don't play. Hold on. I want to show you how cursed this is. Curse description, thank you. Yeah. That was my tummy. My tummy made a made a noise. There we go. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Hold on. Let me bring this up. You don't need to see me, right? Let's watch this really quickly. Look at how cursed this is. I'm actually terrified of this. to show Basil this game if I can't beat it. The cat! <laughs> it's just so weird. It's so creepy! It's perfect, right? You love this? Isn't this great? Batum Batula. So. <laughs> I 
think the fire sounds were happening over that too. <laughs> what did I just watch? I don't know. What did we just watch? I need to know. What is this game? It looks so cursed. This is art. <laughs> you saw it on Switch too? Yeah. I, I mean, after watching a trailer like that, how could you not play that game? I'm just saying. How could you not? It was on sale. I'm extremely confused. I feel like it'd be fun to bumble through. I'll try and play it on stream next week for you guys, but I wanted to tell you about it because it's so weird and it's... I don't think... Has anyone played it on Twitch before? I has to. Sometimes I'll do that. I'll be like, has anyone played this game on Twitch? Oh, yeah. So it's a game. It's definitely a game and people have played it. So why don't we play it? Let, let us play it. <laughs> Let's try and feed the magical birch tree. <laughs> and see what's wrong with this cat <laughs> and try not to get more nightmares than when we read Edgar Allan Poe <laughs> oh, it's a it's a long it's a long what do you call it it's a long spooktober it's a long long spooktober y'all let me put this on for a little bit here. What are you guys doing for your... Are you guys doing anything for Halloween? We're halfway through the month now. Two weeks away. Two weeks away from the special day. I love Halloween so much. I love Halloween so much. I like making weird Halloween food. And dressing up, of course. Which is why I go, I went all out for my... <laughs> so I'm going all out for my spooktobers. You gotta go off. Thank you, Ginge. I'm actually mostly wrapping up because I don't think I can talk too much more, but I just was, I just wanted to listen to this song again <laughs> with you guys. I hope you guys had a fun time. I hope my I hope my reading put you in a great place for the rest of the night or the rest of your day. I want to thank you for joining me. I want to thank you for hanging out with me and I want to thank you for chatting with me. It means a lot to me and I, I appreciate you and I hope you have a good rest of your, your time today or evening. Um, thank you. I think I'm going to leave you guys in some good hands. Aw, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, uh, stay for the raid? Yeah, I'm gonna give you guys I'm gonna I'm gonna I have an idea. I think I have an idea. I keep trying to I like to leave you guys with uh kind of something similar to what we were doing, you know? So I think it makes sense to leave you under the the watchful eye the 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 careful care of uh, Sora actually cuz she's playing Luigi's Mansion 3 and if you liked spooky stories and if you liked whatever ghosties ghouls that uh that brought you here tonight i'm sure you would love to watch luigi sucking up some ghosts <laughs> that's my logic 
Is the tail new? The tail is not new. It's just not uh, always visible. <laughs> tail has been tail has been here since second outfit change. <laughs> it's a subtle tail. I like I like that it is subtle. I like that you haven't like seen it too much. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I, I usually... Ginge is right. I'm usually kind of over here. I'm usually kind of like... Move! Move, Medu! I'm usually over here. But it's there! It's there! Nya nya nya! Nya nya! Alright, my dears. My Kindles. I hope you have a good evening, if it is evening where you are, and I hope that um, you come back next week as we play more random and spooky things to continue our spooktober journey. See you next time. Anyasmi!